Uh, this is uh, uh, an extract from the Technology Review, which is the magazine of, of MIT that reports on technology aspects. And uh, it reported on, uh, on a conference that took place at MIT, which I organized with a number of people. And the conference was on the analysis of mobile phone network. And so the network of mobile phone is just a network in which nodes are cell phone numbers or people. And then there is a connection between A and B if A has called B sometime during the duration of, say, for example, six months. Right? And uh, the reason why I'm, I'm presenting this is that I'm showing this is that if you can see here this picture, this picture represents about 2 million people, 2 million cell phone users in, in Belgium. And uh, of course, you cannot possibly uh, uh, represent uh, a situation, a network like that, where, when allocating a, a pixel for every user, because you do not even have 22 million uh, pixels on the screen. So you need to organize the users. In, in communities, which is what is done here. So these are, I'm probably here somewhere on this side, I, I, I'm perhaps part of that group, and the large group here is about uh, uh, 10 or 50,000 uh, uh, people. So what I'd like to talk uh, uh, during this presentation is a, a situation for very large networks, like the one I've just shown, where you have two million nodes. And there are a number of situations where you have that large networks with hundreds of thousands of nodes, millions or perhaps even more, and with uh, uh, possibly billions of links. So all these are examples of very large networks uh, for which we now have uh, uh, data and for which we can uh, look at representation at how the graphs, the networks are organized, and in particular on, on the uh, look at the community structure, which is what I'm going to describe in this talk. So for example, if you take a look at the citation network, the citation network is a network in which papers are the nodes, and there is a connection between A to B if paper A cites paper B. Right? So you have a data set of, of uh, 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 papers, like the ISI data set, for example, that is used in the web of knowledge, and that one has uh, about 10 million papers, and so you can look at this huge data set and perhaps look at uh, 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 communities in this, this, this network. This is a yet another example just to show, of course, that networks are everywhere. They even on the access uh, uh, website where you can find a, a picture like this uh, that represents the activities at the, 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 the center. So the first part in, of this talk, I'd like to uh, describe a method for identifying communities in very large networks. This, of course, is a small network. There are about 100 nodes. And it's pretty clear what I mean by community when you look at that picture. A, a community is a set of nodes, like the, the, the equally colored nodes here, the red ones here, uh, are a set of nodes that are tightly connected with each other, and they weakly connect with the rest. Okay, and we want to make this definition somewhat mathematically more precise, and there are many competing ways of describing this, but I'll give a rigorous mathematical definition, one possible definition of what a community is. And so we'd like to be able to detect these communities, but not in networks with 100 nodes like we have here, but in networks with uh, hundreds of thousands or perhaps uh, millions of nodes, and to, to detect in an efficient way communities in this very large network. So, so that, for example, once you've defined and once you've identified this community, rather than representing each of these nodes separately, you can instead represent the corresponding communities by just having one node for each of these uh, communities. So that allows you to represent very large network like the mobile phone network as part of this presentation. Okay, so why do we want to look at uh, communities? If you do not construct the community first, what you may possibly have, this is an instant message network where these are, are aliases of people. You just get a complete mess like that. You, have, you, you can have, see some of the links here, but there is very little that you can gain by just mapping a, a graph like that. You'd like to have some, find some of the underlying structure to understand your network. Here's another example on a, a much smaller graph. This graph has only 100 nodes. These are the US senators, and they're colored depending on whether they're Democrats or Republicans. And if you look more carefully at that network, what you find out, and the links are the number of times, that the links, there are weights on the links, and these are the number of times that these senators have voted in the same way on particular resolutions. They voted in the same way, so the, the tides are strong if they, they very often voted the same way. 
So you can, you can uh, uh, split this into the, the Republicans and Democrats and find out that uh, indeed looks like th there is a, a community here uh, and a large community here. And this senator, for example, has never voted the same way as, as this one here because otherwise there would be a leak. Once you've done that, once you've found these communities, what you can also do is to have to look at some of the statistical properties of these uh, resulting community. And an interesting uh, observation in this context is that if you, if you uh, uh, take a, a threshold under which you do not represent an edge to be a little larger than what you have here, what you get as a graph is this one. So the Republicans get completely disconnected, whereas the Democrats are not. So this shows that much more often do Democrats vote in the same way than Republicans do. And this is something that would have been hard to guess from the initial network, but it's, it's a property of the community. So the two communities here, this one and that one, have very statistically different properties. And so when you've confronted to a network that is, that is inhomogeneous, and, and the properties of the connections, perhaps the strength or the distribution or the connectedness and so forth. So if these properties differ in different areas, in different regions of the network, first identifying the community so that you can then look at the statistical properties a useful thing to do. So for example, in the citation network between papers, uh, you would expect by finding the communities in the citation network that maybe you'll find uh, mathematics on one side, physics, and then uh, electrical engineering, computer science. And then you may try to, to look at statistical properties of these different communities and discover that the way people cite each other differs from community to community. So that's another interest of doing community detection. Representation, visualization, statistical properties of communities, and in general, better understanding of, of your network. Okay, so the area of community detection has been an extremely active area over the last five or six years. There have been hundreds of papers. This is a survey paper by Santo Fortunato. It's almost not a paper, but rather a book, because it's a 100-page review paper that has about 500 references, and most of them over the last five or six years. So there have been hundreds of, of methods that have been proposed that allow the detection of uh, communities and networks. It has been an extremely active area and also a very active, a very creative one. So some of these methods are based on optimizations. Some of these methods are based on uh, uh, a statistical, on physics analogy with physical situation like the POTS model, for example. Some others relate to opinion formation. So you have these nodes each having a particular opinion and they, they try to have an opinion that is similar to their neighbor. Then you let the system evolve until they all have uh, a similar opinion and you declare to be in the same community those that have identical opinion. Or maybe you make networks of, of, uh, uh, of differential equation that are weakly coupled, that are coupled through the connection. And when they synchronize, you declare that all those that synchronize, they're, they're part of the same community and so forth. So there are many ways of trying to detect uh, uh, communities. And these are, this is a very nice uh, uh, survey paper that reviews, that reviews several of these methods. The method I want to describe here is one that was developed. It's known as the Louvain method. It's a method that we developed uh, in my research group with, with a number of authors, including uh, Renaud, who is pictured here, and uh, who is now at, in, at Imperial College London, and uh, Jean-Luc Guillaume, who is at the University of Paris. And at that time, they were both uh, postdocs in Louvain. And it's a very simple method. I'll describe it in just one slide. But before I do so, let me say a few things about uh, uh, what, in what area this method has been applied. So these, the method is described in this paper here. And a number of subsequent papers have used the method to analyze a number of different types of large network, like the one you see here. Twitter, LinkedIn, Flickr, YouTube, Live Journal, FreeSon, Web of Knowledge, which is this data set of, uh, of citations. And for each of these uh, examples, I'm, I've tried to uh, give an indication of how many nodes you have and how many connections you have. Right? So the, in the initial paper, we studied a, a subset of the web graph. Today, one believes that perhaps the web graph has about 20 billion pages or whatever. I mean, uh, it's a rough estimate. And in that paper, we had an analysis of a, of a subset of that web graph with 100 million nodes and a billion links, a billion links <coughs> between, the, between the nodes. 
Okay, so the method allows to treat uh, networks that are really large. So, so these are some of the examples of papers that have used the, the, the method. The method has also been uh, implemented, but before I do so, let me just, this is just a, uh, uh, an extract from an email I received two days ago, just to show that there is constant interest in the methods. This is unclassified, so that's the reason I, I'm presenting it here. <laughs> so apparently, uh, the method can possibly be used in many different contexts, including some for which I have little indication. I'm not, I'm not sure what uh, they intend to do with, that, uh, uh, with the Louvain method in that context. <laughs> And it has also been implemented uh, in a number of software, including this freely available software I gave you that's uh, really well done, that allows to, to deal with very large network and represent them, and also identify communities with the method I'm going to present. This is a commercial software that also uses <coughs> the method and that is uh, sold to company to analyze the email exchange networks or the uh, internal phone system exchange network to better understand how the companies, how companies are structured. Okay, so uh, how does the method work? Well, assume you have a, a network like I have here, it's a small network, and I'd like to detect communities in that network. And I've represented here three possible ways of decomposing that network into communities. And the, in one of the interests of community detection methods as they've been developed over the last five years is the fact that you do not need to specify a priori the number of communities that you have in your network. Okay, so these methods work without you specifying how many communities you have. It could be that you have as many communities as you have nodes, or perhaps you have only one community that, that takes all, all the nodes. Okay, and here are two, three examples, including one for which we have three communities, blue, green, and red. And, and these ones are with just two communities, and, and this node is either blue in this case or red in the second one. Which one is the good one? Which one is the good <coughs> decomposition of the graph in two communities? Well, I would say it's, uh, it's up to taste, but I'll introduce now a quantity that is known as modularity that to every partitioning of the graph in two communities, and I remind you that I'm looking at partitioning, so every node belongs to one and only one community. So there are other methods that allow to have overlapping community. We do not allow this in this context. We have every node that belongs to one and only one community. And I'd like to quantify the quality of these three different partitions. So that's exactly what modularity does. Modularity gives you a single scalar uh, just a scalar that shows how good a, mod, uh, a partitioning is. So we're going to assign uh, uh, qualities functions, we're going to define a quality function and uh, qualities for these three partitioning. So what is this quality? The, mod mo the modularity was a, 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 is a notion that was introduced uh, five or six years ago by Mark Newman and it works as follows. Again, let me take this little uh, network and assume that I'm taking these two communities. I'm, I'm separating this network into two. How good is this partitioning of the network? Well, the definition is simply this. We count the number of edges that are within communities, and we'd like this number of edges to be as large as possible. Right? We want this number to be large. And we compare this by subtracting subtracting the number of edges that are internal com to communities minus the expected number of edges within community. And I need to define what the expected number of edges is, and I'm going to provide the definition of that in the next slide. Okay? So I, I look at the number of edges I have in the community, and I'm subtracting this the expected number of edges. And then I have a scaling uh, 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 factor here divided by the total number of edges, and that the, the purpose of that scaling factor is just that and by doing so, I have a quantity that is between minus 1 and 1. So modularity is always between minus 1 and 1. The largest possible value you can have here is 1. And if you have 1, it really means that you've, you've been able to find uh, 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 a, a good uh, community decomposition, whereas the mi where if, you, if you get to minus 1, it's really just the opposite. Getting a, a minus 1 in this quantity essentially means that you have edges only between the nodes of community and no internal edges within the communities. Okay? So how do we define the expected number of edges in communities? Well, we, there, there are several ways of doing this, and you may use different types of model that give you expected number of edges. I'm going to describe now the most common one, and the one in which that was introduced in this, in this paper. 
So I'll first remember for each of these nodes what the degree of the node is. So these are the degrees. The degree of a node is the number of its neighbors. Okay? So this node here has three neighbors. It has degree three. Now that I know what the degrees are, I forget about the edges. And now I have my new model. I, I can now define the expected number of edges. What do I mean by the expected number of edges? Assume you have these nodes here. And you have these nodes here. And they have the given number of degree. The degree, the degree of these nodes is given by these numbers. How many edges would you expect to be internal to that uh, community and how many internal to that community if the graph was random except for the fact that these nodes have exactly these degrees? That's the question. Okay, and that's my new model. That's what I'd like to compare my graph with, uh, uh, with the, the random graph. Okay, so what is the expected number of edges between two nodes? Well, the expected number of edges between two nodes is proportional to the product of their degree. And then there is a scaling factor that is such that if you take, take the, the, the expectation of the total number of edges, you'd like to have 2n. And n is the number of edges. Well, the, the, you, you'd like the, the total number of edges that, that you expect is n, but then there is a factor 2 because you're dealing with degree, and edges always contribute to two units in the total degree. Okay. So for example, if you take this node here and that node there, <coughs> how many edges do you expect between these two? How many edges if, if the graph was random? Well, you would expect a number of edges that is uh, proportional to the product, 3 times 5, 15, divided, so the degree of i times the degree of j, divided by 2m. And in this case, m is equal to 25. We have 25 edges because the graph has 25 edges. And so we expect. 0.3 edges. That's the number of edges we expect between these two. And then we can do the same for all possible pairs of nodes in that community. And that's the total number of edges that we expect in that community. If we do that computation, what we get is this. You get an expectation of 11.56 edges in that community. And you expect 2.56 in that community. And now what remains to be done is just to compare the expected number of edges with the actual number of edges that we observe in the graph. And that will give us the quality function. Okay? So how many edges do we have in the graph? Well, I go back to the graph, to the network I had at the beginning, and what we have is that we have 15 of these edges, and we have 6 here. And so I can compute exactly this, this quantity here, which is the modularity of the decomposition. Okay? And this quantity is equal to 0 0.275. So what is the quality of the, modular, of the, uh, the, the community de decomposition of, of, of my graph? It's given by 0 0.275. I can do so for all possible decomposition of my graph in communities. And in that way, I can then find the one that has highest possible modularity. In this case, this one gives a modularity of 0 0.275, 0 0.32, and 0 0.383. So with respect to this optimization criteria of modularity, the one that should be preferred is this one here. Of course, in this list, I've only considered three possible ways of partitioning my network. In general, there is an exponential number of possible ways. I, I, in order to establish that indeed uh, this is the optimal way, I would need to compare this to all the other possible uh, partitioning of my network, and I'd like to have a partitioning that gives the highest possible modularity. OK? Very well. So what can we say about uh, modularity? Well, I've introduced it here for a very simple situation, but it has been extended in a number of uh, additional contexts, including one where you have networks that are weighted. You have direction on the edges. So you have arrows on the edges. A points to B. It's not the same as B pointing to A. You have type networks, you have time varying networks, you have multi-scale, meaning that you may have the same set of nodes, but then you may have different sets of edges. For example, for papers, you could have A citing B, that's one level, and then the same set of papers, you could connect two papers as soon as there is a common author, for example. And then you could also have a, a third layer where you connect two papers if they've been published in uh, from people in uh, identical institutions, for example, and so forth. 
right? So you can have different layers and still wanting then to discover communities in that set. And that's the, the multi-scale multi or multi-slice. And then you can also consider other null models. In this case, the null model I had was that I expect a number of edges that is proportional to the product of the degree. But I could have additional information about the nodes. For example, if these nodes are distributed in plane, in the plane, it could be that two nodes that are close to each other are more likely to be connected. And, uh, and so I could take that into account in defining the expected number of edges between two nodes. Okay? So the null model could be different from the one I've, I've presented here. So all these can be taken <coughs> here. There are also a number of limitations for modularity. One of them is that the optimization problem shows a very flat landscape. So it may be that very different, and this, this is the, around the optimal solution, uh, it may be that very different partitioning of the network give objective functions that are very similar. And so it's hard really to define where the optimal solution is. And actually, in general, the problem isn't really hard. So it's, uh, it's not a surprise that this <coughs> landscape uh, may, have, uh, uh, may be somewhat complicated. Uh, and then there is also a problem with resolution limits that I'd like uh, to skip here uh, so that I can go to the Louvain method. And before I do so, and justify the fact that we're using a method that is a, a heuristic, it has been established uh, a few years back that the problem of optimizing modularity is, as we, we would typically expect, uh, is a LP, LP hard problem, unless P equal NP, there is no polynomial time uh, uh, optimal solution of, uh, to that problem. Okay, uh, 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 polynomial time optimal solution to that problem. Okay, so let me now describe the, the Louvain method, which is a, a slight variation of uh, a very simple, very natural greedy method. So how does the method work? Let me take a small graph here, and I've numbered the nodes, and initially in the algorithm, every node form a community in itself. So I have as many communities as I have nodes in the graph. And then I, wa I want to increase modularity. How do I do that? Well, I, I consider these nodes in turn, and for each of them, I consider moving them to a neighboring community, and I do so only if it increases the modularity. Right? So I, I'll go through the set of nodes, assume, for example, take node 6, and I'll, I'll consider moving it in the same community as 7, as 2, or at, as 11, for each of these three options, I compute the resulting modularity increase. If it's an increase, I'm taking the one that, is la the la that leads to the largest possible increase. If none of them provides an increase, then I just go to the next node. And I do this successively for all nodes until I reach, I repeat this, until I reach a local optimum. So the local optimum in this case is here. Is this is the one that I've obtained. So this situation is such that if you were, by taking this green node to make it blue or to make it light blue or gray here, uh, you, would, you would decrease modularity. And the same is true for all other nodes. You cannot <coughs> increase modularity of this partitioning by changing one node only. Okay? So this is a local optimum. It doesn't mean that it's the optimal of modularity because it could be that by changing two or more than two nodes simultaneously, I can increase. But you cannot change modularity. You cannot increase modularity by changing just one node. So then what we do once we've achieved this first step, then we think of all these green nodes as being one community or one node in a graph, in a network of community. So I'm, I'm constructing at the next step the network of communities. So these five nodes are now represented by just this node here, and these three blue nodes by this node, and so forth. And then I'm doing what I've just done. I'm doing it again on this network of community. And that then corresponds to possibly moving this one here with this one here. That corresponds to taking all these three nodes and moving them at once with all these green nodes and making them into just one community. So I'm considering merging communities that were obtained at the previous steps. And I do this successively until there is no more gain in modularity. Uh, and so we proceed that way. And uh, 
until we reach a situation where there is no uh, more gain in moderate, then we stop. And in that way, we've uncovered a hierarchy of communities, because this one here is the final situation that corresponds to merging these two and merging these two. Merging these two corresponds to merging these two, and it means essentially making all these nodes into one community and all these nodes in a second community, which is the final outcome of the algorithm. But by looking at the intermediate steps in the algorithm, I can zoom and get sub-communities of communities. Okay? So here's a, the, uh, the result that we get on a sort of fractal shape graph or fractal shape network where you can see this community but when you zoom in that community you get here and then you zoom and you zoom and you can uh, go down at different level uh, and, and get the internal structure of the fractal shape uh, network that we have here. And I'll give a, one more example of a hierarchy of community in a, in a mission. Now, the method I've just proposed uh, is extremely simple to implement and uh, it provides a hierarchy of communities and also it has the advantage that as compared to other methods for community detection that it has very low computation complexity. It hasn't been established formally but it's certainly not n square. We expect it to be more like n log n or even perhaps linear. Okay, so the number uh, it clearly uh, a, a given uh, Step takes a linear time uh, uh, of um, computation, but then it's not quite clear how many of these iterations we need to do. But so as compared to methods that were previously available at the time when we introduced it, uh, this was a complexity that was uh, much better than what was available at that time. At that time, most methods were running in n square, And so it allowed us to, to treat uh, uh, networks of very large scales, such as uh, the one I've shown, uh, I've described before, about 100 million nodes and a billion links, just on a standard PC, just on a PC in two hours and a half. So a billion links, you can deal and detect communities in just two hours and a half on a, on a regular PC. Okay, let me now describe uh, what we got out of that method and the community we got from a, a particular network that was constructed on a mobile phone. And the mobile phone data we have is mobile phone data for uh, one country, for Belgium. Uh, it has about two and a half million customers and these are the figures that we have for, uh, for the data set. So if you look at the evolution of that uh, period of time of the data set, this is an indication of the number of text messages. These are uh, number of people, uh, these are the number of voice messages, and these are the number of people involved. But the no number of uh, voice communication and the number of people involved. So you can see the weekly pattern where uh, this is during the week, this is, on, this is on Friday, there is a peak on Friday because people are probably organizing their weekend or perhaps they're rushing to make sure that they have their work done, that all the, what they intended to do during the week and they haven't had the time to do, they still have to try to do it on Friday. And then on Saturday and Sunday, I mean, things are a bit more, uh, uh, a little quieter, okay? And you can also see here, for example, this drop here, which corresponds to November the 1st, uh, this huge peak here are uh, text messages uh, being sent uh, just at uh, New Year. And some people send also text messages at Christmas. And some people also send, send text messages here. So this little peak here, anyone? Huh? Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day, exactly. So these are text <laughs> messages for Valentine. <laughs> okay, so you can see, you can see some, some of the activity in a country by just looking at this uh, weekly. If you look at the number of calls received and the number of people who receive that number of calls on a, on a log log scale, so this is a log log scale, so this is how many people received 10 calls. So 10 calls is here and that's the number of people that received that many calls. How many people received 100 calls? That's the number of people <coughs> who received 100 calls. And so you see that the largest number that we get here is the number of people who received just one call. Okay. And uh, uh, I'm showing this just to, sh to, uh, to, to, to show that uh, it's, it's, not, it's clearly not a distribution that is centered around an average. 
So it's not like you could say, on average, people have received that many calls. If it was centered around an average, it would look, it would probably, the distribution would probably look like that. Whereas this distribution looks more like a scale-free distribution that you get in networks that are known as, as scale-free networks. Okay? So this is just, a, this is just a, to have, give an idea of what the communication graph may look like. It is not a graph like this, where you have a, a, a distribution of the number of calls received that is centered around a, a given value, but it's more like a graph like that. Uh, this is the duration of calls with distance. I'm showing here a few statistics before actually discovering the communities in that network because I find it uh, very fascinating how much information you can get. Of course, these are anonymized network, right? So the, all the numbers have been scrambled, right? So, uh, uh, but still, it's, a very, it's amazing to see how much information you can get out of the, the data, including, in this case, the duration of communication with distance. As distance increases, the, the duration of your conversation increases as well. So more interpretation for this is that when you're in this range, it's probably that you, you meet the person, you're going to meet the person a little later on that day or perhaps the next day. And so this is just a, perhaps a coordination communication, whereas uh, the, the, the plateau at about four minutes is perhaps a longer term, long, a longer distance course for discussion of a particular topic without having a uh, uh, just a coordination uh, call. And then this is a, a very interesting observation uh, which, for which we have no, that has been since then established in, a, in a, I'm, I'm showing it here, uh, that has also been shown in other data sets and for which there is no, uh, no explanation so far. So I'm still looking for uh, 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 a proof. I mean, there are simulations that show that this is likely to occur, but there are no formal proof. So let me describe the observation. This is the distance between people where they, they, where they typically live. So the way we establish, we, we compute the distance is that we do not, the, the, the numbers are scrambled. We do not have location, exact location information about people, but we have the, the zip code of their billing address. So the zip code of their billing address is, 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 is what we use as a proxy for the place where they live. So then we can look at how likely it is that two people living at a particular distance, uh, uh, how likely they are to communicate with each other. And if you look, if you plot this on a log log plot, what you get is here, these set of poles, and you see that they, they, they very closely follow a, 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 straight, a straight line that has a slope of <coughs> minus two, which shows, which shows that the probability of communicating between, of, of communication between two people de decreases with the square of the distance. If you double the distance, you decrease your probability of communication by four. Okay, so, and this has also been shown in another data set. This is for another, another country by other authors, and there they use as a proxy for the location. They have some information about the antennas from which people are, are, are making phone calls. And you get the same, same type of the exponent. There is slightly different. Here, the limit, we reach the limit of the size of the country. So we may just disregard that part. But on this, this part here, you almost exactly have a straight line that has a minus 1.8. So the decrease with distance is more like d to the 1.8. It's not d squared, but d to the 1.8. And I have no explanation for that. This, this probably means that if you take your cell phone and you look at the, the contacts you have on, on, on your contact list on your cell phone and you look at how far away these people are, you'll have the same decrease of, uh, with distance. You'll have lots of friends around you and then a little less and a little less. And, and how is that going to decrease with distance well, according to this, to this slope of distribution? Okay, so there, there is a one explanation that was proposed, and maybe I can describe this because this is a form of a conjecture, and uh, some of you may uh, try to, uh, to establish this conjecture. So this is a, a, a well-formulated mathematical question that has, been, uh, that has been shown by simulation, but a mathematical proof is still lacking. So the, the, the explanation is this, and uh, here's the conjecture. You are here, and you have a number of friends, and they're located there, okay? And why is it that the probability of connection decreases with d squared? Here's the possible explanation. 
Every node has limited energy. And if you have friends far away, it consumes more time, more energy to keep that relation. Because from time to time, you perhaps have to go to the friend and visit him, so it consumes more time. So the, the way you compute energy is by just summing up all the distance to all your friends. So assume now you have this network, and all these nodes have the same constraints. That they have the same constraint that the sum of the distance to all their friends is upper bounded by this limited energy. And I assume we all have the same energy. Okay? So that's the constraint. And what do you optimize? What you optimize is access to information, some measure of what information you have access to. Well, there, there, there are different ways one can quantify this access to information, but one of them would be to look at the number of people you can reach by taking path of length two. Okay, so assume you're confronted to that problem. You have a limited energy. You have people distributed in the plane. Uh, the sum of the distance to your friends is bounded, uh, and is, is the same bound applies to all nodes. And all these nodes try to do is to maximize the number of people they can reach by path of length two. And the conjecture is that if you do so, if you optimize that, if all these nodes simultaneously try to optimize that objective function, then you get a distribution that has this shape that I showed. I don't know whether this is uh, mathematically uh, true, but this is open for, uh, for, for proof. OK, so let me now describe what we got on this, on this network, uh, uh, this mobile phone network with the community detection. This is what we got. So these are communities, and the size of the community depending on the number of people you have there. And so you have these, all these communities are, and quite clearly, there seems to be some, some form of separation there, right? Now you may, know, you may know that in Belgium we have two main languages, French and Dutch. And so we thought that maybe that was related to language. So we, we went back to the mobile phone operator and asked whether they had any information about language. And they said, of course we have, because we're sending bills. And when we send bills, we have to choose the language in which we send the bills. So we asked whether they could provide that language information, which they did. And we plotted it back on the data. And this is what we got. So it may look like we're using two colors, but that's not the case. Actually, we're using a spectrum of color. And this one is a mixed color, as you can see. We're using a spectrum of color. But for most of these communities, they are mostly dominated by just one language, right? So one of them is French, and the other one is, is, uh, is Dutch. And the brown here, uh, we thought that maybe that was a community located in Brussels, because Brussels is the capital of, of Belgium, and it's bi bilingual, even though about 80% of the people there uh, are French-speaking. And so we could zoom in that region, since we have this hierarchy of, of communities, we could zoom there and you get this distribution, then you could zoom again and get another distribution and so forth. And you can see here that it, I mean, the language there in Brussels is quite mixed. Okay, all these communities are quite mixed. But we wanted then to, uh, to confront this to, to the data and see whether indeed this is actually located in Brussels. And since we had location information about people, so we had uh, the zip code of their billing address, <coughs> anonymous, right? For the, the people are anonymous in the data set, but we have the zip code of this anonymous number. Uh, we constructed uh, a big network that relating all the cities in, in Belgium and, uh, uh, and connecting <coughs> them with a strength that depended on the number of communication that being between between the different countries. So, uh, I may describe the result there, but before doing so, I was thinking of maybe uh, showing a, a quick movie that described the, the present situation. I don't know whether I have time or not, because yeah. yes. Okay, so this is a quick movie <coughs> that uh, shows the, the present political situation in, in Belgium and the reason why we have difficulties for the moment in Belgium. I didn't did produce the movie myself, it's on YouTube. And you, I, I, I took a, a, a small part of it. So I hope that the sound is going to work here. We'll see, right? Uh, no, so. You better plug the. You have plug. to plug the sound cable. Uh, so the sound is oh, plugged. Yeah. In front of you. Black. Black cable. This yeah. one here. Okay. Oh, I had the wrong one. Yes.
Okay. In 50 years, Belgium has produced the best experts in engineering with the most inefficient political structure. Belgium excels at making everything as complicated as possible in their three national languages, Dutch, French, and German. They have one central government. Then, they have three regions, each with a government that has as much power as the central government. This is a very good way to make running the country totally impossible. Fortunately, only the region of Brussels in the center is bilingual in French and Dutch. The Flemish region is monolingual in Dutch. Although there are administrative services for the French speaking here, here, and here, and also here, and oh yes, here. And French speaking citizens can be judged in French in the so-called BHE county, where a strong minority speak French. Wallonia is also a pure French speaking territory. Well, except here, and here, and also here, where the German speaking minority lives. So, to deal with these numerous minorities, the Belgian Wycliffe technologists decided that three regions were not sufficient and added three additional structures called the communities. There are three communities, Dutch, French, and German. Like the central state and like the regions, each community has a government and a parliament. And, for instance, the French community supply cultural and social services to the French-speaking people in Wallonia and in Brussels. But they may not supply any services to the 300,000 French-speaking fellows in Flanders because Flanders is monolingual and foreign speakers must speak Dutch. God verdom. The German community can only act in Wallonia, the French-speaking region, while the Dutch community acts in the Brussels region or in Flanders. So, you see, a French-speaking family in Brussels could depend on the central government for granddaddy's pensions, on the French community government for the music academy, the Dutch community government for the children's school, the Brussels government for the garbage recycling, and so on. So, as a whole, you can have ministers of four different governments working for one Brussels family. Now you'll understand why Belgians can't live together and they can't live apart. The Belgian... I believe you got the picture, right? So, uh, <laughs> Belgium is a complicated country, even though we've managed to live together for, uh, uh, for close to 200 years, but we are now in a great, great uh, political trouble since uh, during the last election that took place about a year ago, <laughs> the, the political party that won the election in the Northern Party is one that, is, that wants to have the country uh, more separated than it is today, right? And so that's the reason why we are in, still in crisis and we haven't been able to form a government since the election of about a year ago. We haven't had a, a, a new government since then. And these are just uh, shows a, a few uh, extracts from the press that, 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 that explains this. So we thought that because we had the data and you understood also that the geogra geography of Belgium is completely crucial in this discussion because there are tensions about what part should belong to where, and since we had a, a, a data set that would that tell where, how people communicate with each other, that it, it essentially says something about the social structure in the country, we thought that maybe we could use that data set in order to, uh, uh, to exhibit these social, uh, uh, this social context. So here's the map of Belgium with all the counties. And uh, uh, we've constructed first the, the network, the natural network, where uh, two counties or two communes or two cities are, are uh, connected with a uh, edge whose strength depends on how intense the communications are between the two, uh, the two counties, right? So this is, oh, sorry. This is the edge starting from here, from this city here, and you can see this decrease of intensity of communication, even though the, the rate, the price you pay for a communication does not depend on distance, even though it does not depend on distance, people just call locally. And this, is, this clearly shows this, uh, this uh, d to the square decrease of, of intensity. Uh, what we observed for the people, uh, the, the connection between people, we can again do at the level of the cities, and this is a uh, uh, an observation for the intensity of communication between cities. If you look at the distance between two cities, and then you look at the average calling duration, and you plot this on a log-log scale, again, you get this very nice 
uh, straight line, as soon as you reach distances that are larger than 10 kilometers, this very nice uh, straight line that shows a minus <coughs> 2 decrease. So that's actually the average cooling duration between two cities is directly proportional. So this is the average duration of communication between two cities is directly proportional to the product of the population divided by the distance to the square. So if you take two cities and you multiply the distance by two and you keep the same number of people in both of them, if you multiply the distance by two, the amount of communication you have between the two will decrease by a factor four. Okay, so this is the gravitation law for communication between cities and it has been observed in a number of different contexts, uh, not only for communication but also for trade exchanges in a, in a number of different situations. And as I, as I said before, I have no, uh, this is an empirical observation, but I have no uh, satisfactory theoretical explanation for that uh, decrease with d squared. Okay, so uh, what do we get when we compute and we identify communities? Depending on the weights we put on the edges, we can put the average duration time of communication, that's the map we get here, or we can put the frequency of communication, that's the map we, we, we get here, these are the two maps of, of Belgium that we got. They tell different stories because this one here clearly shows the, the, the uh, French uh, uh, Dutch separation. Actually, the community that we get follows exactly the dividing line between the two communities, except for a few towns, and except also for the fact that Brussels is attached in that uh, analysis to the southern part. And uh, also this county here and that one here is also attached to Brussels. And this one here uh, is, tells a different story but shows instead perhaps that Brussels goes beyond its uh, administrative uh, uh, border since it, it goes outside of it and takes some of the uh, Brabant in the northern part and also the, 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 the southern Brabant, Brabant Wallon. Okay, so uh, we, we, we published this in... Uh, in a scientific journal, and uh, I was very surprised that uh, it got uh, a, a, a little bit of attention from the press. As a as, as scientist, uh, it is hard to have more than 10 or 20 people reading your scientific production, right? So for the first time in my life, I believe, uh, we've been read, these are the national newspapers in Belgium that all in their first page, uh, and also the tele on television and news, uh, report on this. So for for uh, for an algorithm that we devised in Louvain uh, that was probably read by a few, a few scientists now by applying it to a particular data set we got a little bit more attention uh, in, in the press. Okay, so I think that uh, uh, I had more to say but I, I believe that I'm al already beyond my allotted time so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and I'll be happy to take any question. Thank you. Okay, thank you.